Um, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Donald Scott. Um, Donald has had a very long association with the school and is a widely respected and much loved character in Watsonian circles. Uh, Donald told me just a few minutes ago that he was 88 years old and one month. Correct. Today, Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, May the 23rd, uh, 2016. So, congratulations, Donald. Now, I'd like to talk to you mainly about your experience at Watson's, but can you mention a little bit about your childhood in Langham? And yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Well, I grew up in Langham, I was born there, and uh, I can remember that there was tough times in the 30s. There was a lot of unemployment at that time, and my father was an engineer, he had lost his job, and things were not great at that time. But the war came along, and People with father's experience were immediately grabbed and he was given employment with the war office of servicing planes. They were trained, I think they were tiger moths and they were used for uh, training pilots to fight the measurements. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, fight the measurements. Yeah. People would then go on from the tiger moth to war planes. Like the Spitfires and Harry yes. So father got a job there and that was the making of him because he went on and became very popular and very good at what he could do and he loved it, he loved it there. So I was in Langham Academy until I was 14 and then I went off to Dumfries Academy yes. because it was the only local senior secondary school and I loved it there. It was tremendous and very much sports orientated and I was asked if I would, coming from Langham, I would probably like to play rugby. And I said, uh, well, how many games of rugby will I get a year? And the answer was two or three probably, because we're not a rugby playing school. So I played soccer and uh, I played every week and was in the school team within about three or four weeks of arriving there. And uh, captained the school team in my last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, not blowing my horn, but I captained yeah. the cricket team as well that yeah. year. And represented the school in badminton and one or two other sports. So I had a lovely time there and I uh, had to make a decision whether I would go and read English at university or whether I would do physical education. And uh, what swayed it for me was that uh, a pal of mine said, if you go and do English and get a degree in English, what will you do? And I thought, well, journalism sounds pretty good and sports journal journalism would be better. And then the damper came, well, you do realise if you're commenting on sport, you're not playing it. And that was it. I said, oh, well, in that case, I must play my sport. Mm -hmm. So I turned that down. I went to college and qualified and then did national service. And while I was there, I played for the army and combined services. So it was, again, it was a funny period of time, actually, Rod, because I went in and it was away in the south of England, Winchester. And there was nobody else in my unit who played rugby. And about three weeks in doing national service, I got a, a letter saying I'd been picked for Scotland. It's actually quite funny. We're sitting in the, the naffy where we're having a <laughs> cup of coffee. And this chap, I, I was going into the, a, um, the Army Educational Corps. And this chap sitting next to me was reading the Telegraph. Um, very posh paper, you see, and he said, oh, here's a wee note about the Scotland team. They've dropped a guy called D.A. Sloan, and they brought a bloke in called D.M. Scott. He said, that's you. And this was the first I'd heard of it. Yeah. Uh, a letter arrived from yes. home because it had been sent to my hometown, yes. and then yes. on, so it was a bit late getting there. So this was the first I'd heard. And I had to get a visa to go to uh, Dublin to play in that game. Oh, well, yes. Things were pretty sticky during yeah. the war years between Ireland and, and of course. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that was my, my first time. And all this time, when I was doing my basic training, mm -hmm. no rugby. Mm -hmm. So I got my first cap having not played rugby for four weeks, yeah. not having trained for four weeks, yeah. except doing some squad bashing up and down the parade ground. Yeah. So it was a really funny time. And that went on throughout the rest of that year. I mm -hmm. played for the army and I played for Scotland. and. Uh, didn't do any training in between. No training? No. It should be fine. Uh, and you mentioned also Yorkshire, you're qualified? To yes, I went down. Once, yes. I, once yes. I qualified, we, did, we had to do a three-month course for the uh, Army Education Corps to get 
or three stripes, mm. and we were then able to be let free to teach. These were some of the best students we ever had. Mm -hmm. The War Office decided in the wisdom that anybody holding the rank of sergeant and uh, corporal mm. had to hold certain qualifications, yeah. and many of them didn't. And if they didn't have the qualification, of course, they would be demoted in rank. And you can imagine the Ferrari if the long-serving sergeant was suddenly told, you're no longer a sergeant, mm. and you can't go to the sergeant mess, which was the best mess in the army. Oh, yes. yeah. So these chaps worked like mad when we had 27 of them, and uh, we worked for about two to three weeks. And we worked from nine o'clock till five, and they insisted that they would come back at, at 6.30. Mm -hmm. And this went on till about nine o'clock, and I think that they all qualified, they all passed, and the party that uh, took place afterwards was unbelievable. I was away playing rugby, so I missed most of it. Yes, but they really loved it, and they were great. They were great students. Yeah, good time. So I just qualified for Yorkshire when I was up in Yorkshire, and being, having been posted there, and uh, in the wisdom, I would have been playing for in the Army Cup for the Duke of Wellington Regiment, mm -hmm. the uh, Army Educational Corps didn't have much of a team, but because I was up in that area, I was affiliated to the Duke of Wellington's, and they had the, uh, the uh, English halfbacks, Hardy and Shuttleworth, and we had a really good team, and we probably would have won the Army Cup. However, the Army School of Education wanted me back oh. down in Cornwall at that time. So off I went there, very disgruntled, knowing that I couldn't then qualify and play for them, having already been committed to play for the, the, other, the other team. But I, I then played basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we won the, no, we were runners up in the, in the whole of Europe, in the Army so the, the, the competition then. It was really good so, fun. So you've reached a high level of sport, a high level in lots of different sports. Yes, uh, uh, yes. I think a lot of it came pretty naturally. Right? Yes. You know, I really wasn't a great person who worked very hard. I mean, I, I was very competitive. Yes. And when I went onto the field, I only had one idea that I would play according to the rules of the game mm -hmm. and I would do my best to win. Yeah. But not at any price, you know. Yeah, I, yes. I did this. And this is what I instilled into the, my pupils when I went on to coach them rugby yeah, yeah. and cricket and everything. You had to be very honest to the laws of the game and also to yourself. And it was very important to get that message through to them. So, uh, yeah, I, enjoy, I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed winning, yeah. but uh, not at any price. I'm sure that message came across to generations of, of school pupils. Yes. And they still remember that now. Yeah. Well, they, they do. I think when we have reunions and you know, I bump into one or two mm. of them, one of the nicest things said to me was a chap, Bob Keddy, who he got one cap for Scotland and should have had many more. He came to, from the south of England, he came up to Edinburgh for a reunion and he said, you know, I wouldn't have come until I heard you were you were going to be there. Yes. And he yes. said, I felt I owed you something, and he came along. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I can vouch for that, having spoken to many former pupils mm -hmm. and their attitude towards you. How um, Did your international uh, career, rugby career, um, go on into your time at Watson's, or only did it overlap? Only, only briefly, briefly, I got nine of my caps before coming to Watson's, mm -hmm. and only got one thereafter. Right. Um, I think there was something about the fact that you were playing in the city in front of army, some army, but Scottish selectors quite yes. a lot. And I think at that time there was an inclination for them to look at what you, the mistakes you maybe made oh, rather than the, the overall yeah. picture of what yes. you could do. Yes. Uh, because a lot of, and I'm not speaking up purely personally, but there are a lot of chaps who played for Scotland only once or twice. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if you got in and got comfortable in yes. the team, yes. you'd be a much better player. Yes. But they were pulled out and somebody else was thrown in another place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just when we were chatting before the interview, you said that your arrival at Watson's was due to much luck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you explain that? Yes. Well, John Miller, who was at that time when I came to Watson, who was head of physical education here, had taught me briefly at Dumfries Academy. He had come back from the war and returned to teach at the academy, and he was head of, of PE down there. So he came to Watson's, and they were then, after a while, they were looking for another member of physical education staff. When I see the size of the staff nowadays, it, <laughs> my mind is just scrambled because there was just two men. Yeah. 
and a swimming instructor to look after the whole of the senior school. Yeah. And there was a lady who looked after the primary mm -hmm. department. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing was, of course, um, because of the war and other things, uh, it was a very elderly staff. Yeah. And I think the next two people to me were probably about nine years older or ten years older, and nobody yes. my own age there. Yeah. But the staff that were there, and still I revere them to this day, they were fantastic people. Yeah. Yeah. There was a sort of hierarchy in the common room, and younger members of staff weren't allowed to sit on that chair oh. or that chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, and you said that much luck was involved, so you came to Watson's, but. Um, there was another possibility that opened itself up just before yes, you came to Watson's, yes. wasn't there? Well, I would have led you in a very different direction. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> and it really, it, it's very intriguing to see what, think what might have happened. But uh, I became very friendly with it, a rugby player, a French rugby player, Michel Pomathias, mm -hmm. and he got twenty-one caps for France. He was a big, tall, but a six-foot-two winger and scored many tries. And he said to me, come on, why spend your time playing rugby in Scotland in all the wind and the rain and the <laughs> snow? He said, come to the south of France. And I really thought for a while that I might do that. I said to him, however, what, what would I do for a job down there? And he said, well, you wouldn't need to work for a start, he said, because we'd be well looked after. Now, I think that probably meant to be a, 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 a spot of professionalism involved and that made me back off a little bit yeah, yeah. but uh, he said no no he said we'll, we'll be pretty good to you and he said you'd learn lots of things including he said you'd learn all about wine yeah. and then he said you could go back to Edinburgh and uh, open wine shops and of course this would be many many years ahead of its time if I'd yeah, done that yeah. in the late 50s. <laughs> that was very exotic at the time. Oh absolutely yeah. yes yeah. yes if you asked a number of people uh, in the, in the, on the street mm -hmm. to, to name half a dozen wines. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you would never get anybody who would mm -hmm. give you much of an answer to that. So that was really, it was, it was quite, uh, it, was, it was fun thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. But being offered this job, it was, a, it was a prime job. It's one of the you know, best schools in the country and mm -hmm. I felt I couldn't and be silly to turn it down. Yeah, well luckily for Watsons you didn't, yeah, but yeah, you yeah. must think sometimes nostalgically of, yes. of a different life maybe. Well also the other thing that might have happened was that I might have gone to Rugby League because, uh -huh. because yeah, they, they came it. knocking on my door uh, on two or three occasions. Yeah. On, one, on one occasion one of them turned up at the campus at Jordan Hill Training College when I was still a student yeah. and it was very tempting. You know, to try and put it into its modern equivalent of cost. I mean, I think that the uh, one of the clubs was going to give me something like about four or six thousand pounds. Now it doesn't sound an awful lot of money, but you could buy two five-bedroom bungalows for that sort yes, of stuff. Yes. And for a young boy who had nothing much in his pocket at that stage, start, just starting off, uh, it was a bit, a little bit tempting. Mm -hmm. But being a boarder, we'd all been had drilled into us. Mm. Don't speak to people from the right. Yeah, yes, that was a very strong code. One. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And one of the nice things was that one of the one of the great uh, rugby league managers. He was a great rugby league player himself. Uh, Risman, Gus Risman. He was one of the. If you speak to people who know about rugby league, yes. he would say that he was one of the greatest players, and yeah. also then became a very good manager. He actually came and knocked on my door in Langham and said, I want to sign you, because he said, I think you've got a lot of potential. Yeah. And I had to say to him, no, no thank you. So here you were at Watson's, and um, how long was it before John Miller retired and you took over? Oh, quite a number of years. John went on for quite a period of time. I, I think John didn't leave, retire until the mid-70s, but I took over oh. a bit before that, oh, because he switched to, to uh, Guidance. Oh, I but I, you know, I couldn't tell you, Rod, at yeah, the moment, yeah, just yeah, yeah. what actual well, you year became, that You was. became head of PE, yes, which now director of sport, as they call it. Yes, I know, yes. And um, at what point did you get involved in the boarding houses? Well, that was again um, late, late 60s, I think mm. it was about 1968-ish, mm. around about that time. Um, my family was still quite young then, yes. and we did ten years there. 
and uh, I took over from Alec Weston, who was a, yes. uh, a renowned schoolmaster oh, yes, that yes. everybody who remembers him will speak yes. very fondly of. Well, I went for a while as an assistant to him for to do take prep twice a week yes. and got to know the boys quite well. And then when he was retiring from the boarding house, he asked that I should take over from him. So Pat and I did that for ten years. Yes. And which and which house was it? It was Bainfield House. Yes. Which is where? Which is in Gilsland Road. Yes. And if you were to walk past it now, you could hardly believe because it's all been turned into flats. Yes. The house itself is into about half a dozen flats, but mm -hmm. they built so many others in the grounds. Yes. It's, yes. it's not what I remember. It. No. How many boys did you have in the house? We had 30. Yeah. Give or take. You know. yeah. of, all, of all ages or...? F from senior school upwards. It's senior school. Very occasionally you would have a primary set yeah, boy, but yeah. mostly it was senior one upwards. And you and Pat were surrogate parents. Yes, yes, yes. At the same time as having your own family growing up in the house. Absolutely, too. yes, yes, yes. Pat was very, very good. I mean, she was great. She was the cook on the cook's day off, and she was matron on the matron's day off. And <laughs> she, she, she just entered into it, and mm -hmm. she was very, very good. And good with the boys as well. Oh, yes. And much better thing than I was. Oh, I'm sure. No, no, no <laughs> both of you would be, yeah. And, uh, was there quite a sort of house spirit there? Yes, I think there was. Yes. I, th I, th I think the memory that I have is that a lot of the boys kept you know, saying to me, we were quite open about this, they said, you're too strict, Mr. Scott, with this. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's a very difficult thing for me to pick up the phone and phone one of your fathers and say, Johnny's not back from town tonight yeah. Yeah. Um, because he's got up to mischief doing this, mm -hmm. that and the other thing. So. Um, we, I, I was very fair, but I mm -hmm. did say to them, this is the important thing, that you do not let anybody down. Yes. And occasionally a boy would come and say, or two boys would come and say, we want to do this, we're really anxious to do it. And I said, there is an element of risk here. Mm -hmm. But my father would let me do it, and I would hand the phone over yeah. to them and say, well, <laughs> phone your dad. And if he gives you the okay, I'll be quite happy yeah, with that. Yeah. But they didn't, they didn't they rise didn't to rise, No, <laughs> good for you. So you said... Quite strict lines. Well, I felt but, yes, yes, I felt it, and I, and it was in a way it was really quite nice because some, many years afterwards I'd meet some of these boys, yes, and yes. they would say the same thing as I'm saying to you that yes, I was possibly a little bit strict, but now that we're family of our own, we appreciate it. And, <laughs> you know, so you know it worked out pretty well. Yes. I'd always felt I'd rather make a mistake that way rather than Do just let the kids run. And you know, we had one or two boys when John Watson's closed and yes. we got one or two there. They had been in boarding houses where the, it, it, they were much freer mm. um, and they could more or less come and go as they wanted to. And mm. uh, I thought it was a bit risky, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But, so there we are. But why did you leave the house at the end after the 10 years? Well, I just felt that was long enough. Yes. Um, it's, it was. You know, 24 hours a day, really, yes. and seven days a week, and we, yes. we worked very, very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we had a, a house in North Berwick at that time to escape to in the holidays, mm -hmm. I came up to cut grass and things like this mm -hmm. and make sure the house was all right. And, yes. uh, so you never really got away with it. Yes. The good thing was that I then, you know, we had one or two very good assistant uh, housemasters. Yes. And, and that took a lot of weight off. They would do prep a couple of times a week, just yes. as I used to do for Alec. Yeah. And uh, every second weekend, they be, I mean, not that we were very far away, but they would take over the mantle and be more or less in charge. Yes. And it was good for the good, good training for them. Yes. And, uh, How many different boarding houses were there? At that well, time? At, <coughs> at that time, there were just the two. Um, when I went in, and then they opened a third one, Myerside House, mm -hmm. which uh, Dr. Baston was uh, English master of Watson's, and he, he took that on, and he was followed in that house by Jim Cowan, yes. another revered figure, yes. great schoolmaster. Yes. So then that gave us three, and when the merger came, we had a girl's house as well, yes. and that was just beside the Tipperlin Gate. Yes. Um, so in, in, all in all, I think we had about a hundred, around about 100 boys and I think maybe 25 to 30 girls. Yes. And then eventually they were, these houses were closed, sold off? Well, and yes, they, that happened and we moved, the boarders then moved into 
a large house on campus. Yes. And um, I was not an advocate of that. I yeah. felt that in a day school, as we were, mm -hmm. it was quite nice for the boarders to walk out of school with the rest of the day boys, yes. chatting to each other as they yes. went yeah. various ways, and our boys would peel off and go to the boarding house yeah. out with the campus. Yeah. I felt that was quite good. And I felt if they were staying inside the, 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 uh, the school, yeah. it wasn't just wasn't yeah. quite right. Was that a decision taken for economic reasons or I think, I think educational almost, reasons? I think almost economic. entirely yeah. economic reasons, yes. Yeah. Um, now, um, your, t your career as a rugby coach, you become a legendary rugby coach in the school. <laughs> how, many, how many years did you coach the first 15? I, I think it was about 33. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can remember times when I turned to speak to various people and say, would you not like to try and do this? And they said, no, 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 no. I haven't got quite enough time to, to, to yeah. do it. Um, yeah, I loved doing it. it. It gave you a lot of satisfaction. It was a tremendous satisfaction, yes. It was, it was good. And, uh, and I had some good assistance to it. And I, I, above all else, you see, Rod, because we were a school with this rugby tradition, there were a huge number of people on the staff who had a knowledge of rugby football. Yeah, yeah. And I was so lucky to have people from the different departments who offered to help out. And these were great people like, mm -hmm. over the years. That, you know, they, didn't, they didn't probably get as much of the, an accolade as they should have done, but I did appreciate them very, very mm -hmm. much indeed. Yeah. So it made my job a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I see this, as I say, the size of the department now, it's yes. amazing. And that's probably because of pressure on staff nowadays. Yes. They probably just don't have as much free time. Yeah, because you had a, a, a large number of just or teachers of other subjects who'd come yes, down and, that's right, and yes. coach. Nowadays, there must be very few, I think. Well, I just don't know what the, the, yeah. the numbers are at mm -hmm. the moment, but certainly in these days we relied so heavily on them. Mm -hmm. Yes, people turning up. And, and you, you obviously had um, your stars, many, many of the boys you coached went on to international careers. Yes. A yes. whole back division, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. And there were, yeah. And I think we only had one forward, uh, Ian Lambie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Tells you something about my background. <laughs> yes. Forwards are not important. Yes. <laughs> but there's another boy, Robin Talbert, who uh, was the nephew of a uh, player, uh, again, come back to me in a minute who played for Watsonians and also Kelso. Well, isn't it terrible when your memory goes, it'll come back to me. But he was a nephew of this other person who had played for Scotland and also been a British Lion. And Robin was a he was going to, he, I think he had a trial, and he would have played for Scotland. Mm -hmm. But he up sticks and off he went to Canada. Oh, Ken Smith was the name I was looking for. Oh, yes, yes. And this was Robin Talbot, who was his nephew. Mm -hmm. And he was about six foot four and mm -hmm. I was huge for the, that, that time. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays I see the boys who are playing for the school team and they are bigger than the people who played in, the, in my international team. Yes, because uh, earlier you mentioned um, that your, your French friend who oh, yeah, was a winger at yeah. six foot two. Six foot two, yeah. Um, he, which was exceptional in those oh, days. Yes, but, but now that's quite small. Absolutely. But he could have fitted in quite easily. Mm -hmm. But whereas J.V. Smith of England who was in Cambridge University, I think was about five foot six or so and about barely 10 stone yeah. and he was minute but he, he couldn't play at all now, they would just kill him. Do, do you think that the, the, the different way of playing professional rugby nowadays has brushed off into school rugby? Yes, I, I, think, I think it's become a boring game. I, I admire the skill of the defensive coaches. Yeah. They have set up a, a defence system that is very difficult to in, in the old yeah. days, you would have about a dozen clear-cut breaks each mm. half of the game, yes. you know, so you would, you'd always have a bit of excitement. That would be bread and butter to you. Well, that's right. <laughs> and, and I can think of other people that played like uh, Kenny Scotland at fullback and yes. Andy Irvin. And yeah. these people, when they got the ball, there was a real buzz in the air, as there is now when Stuart Hogg gets the ball. Yes. Well, the same thing happened in these days. And because the defences were not set up so well, um, there were always opportunities and uh, you would see these people creating gaps and giving the people something to uh, shout about. Now I feel it's, 
they're all playing to the same hip shit, you know, they're all doing the same thing, pick up the ball and drive, and yeah, drive. It's become a physical contact. Recycle, drive again. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yeah. And I think that unless they do something about this, I don't think it's, I think we'll not attract any more huge number of people. Mm -hmm. Internationals will always be well supported. Of course. Yeah. But there's not many people going to club games now. Mm -hmm. Which is a great tragedy. Yes. Lots of other things for people to do nowadays, of course. Yes, on a normal Saturday afternoon, yes, there's the crowds at, at my own. side yes. watching what's on. Yes. Very small. Very small. And it's the same throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you see the, your own school subject of PE develop over the years? Um, well, because there's so yes. much more to it than just yes. the rugby. And it, so was, on. it was. I must say that. In the three years that I attended Jordan Hill College in Glasgow, I felt they were not moving ahead of the times. I mean, I, I didn't know a great deal about it, mm -hmm. but there was something that was not quite right. Mm -hmm. People were more or less told to line up in, in rows, yes. you know, and we would stand for 20 minutes, swing our arms and legs and on that spot, yeah. and then maybe towards the end of a lesson we might do a little bit of apparatus work. And this was all dictated to what you had to do at each place. Now they were all so busy trying to improve what they were doing that without knowing it they were benefiting themselves and giving me an easier time because I was giving them an incentive yes. to go and do something. Yes. And because of that I think they became happier. Yes. I know that at one stage when youngsters were asked to come to do physical education, one or two of them were un very unhappy in these mornings. The parents couldn't understand why. And this was because one of my pre predecessors, whom I mentioned before, yes. was very keen that they achieve what they were unable to achieve. Yes. And they didn't see the fact that the good boys loved him. Yes. Those that, you know, were really good, the top 20%, yes. but not the rest. Not they struggled. The rest. So. Yes. Um, how did the amalgamation affect your work? I mean, suddenly you had to yeah. take the girls in, lady colleagues. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think it worked brilliantly. Mm -hmm. We knew the, the staff from the girls' school really well. Dorian Smith was a great, you know, head of phys oh, physical yes. education yes. there, and. Uh, Dot Brown, Dot Brown. Which she was yes. again a legend, you know, yes. and they came and they fitted in there. Well, we knew they brought kids over to play badminton and things like this, so, you know, they were, they were accustomed yeah. to our place and they, they brought the children over to swim in the pool, yeah. so they knew where, where they were coming to and yeah. we welcomed them and I really didn't find there was much of a problem. Right. Yes, it's, it's really quite good mm -hmm. and I thought if we can do this, in physical education yeah. and amalgamate so successfully, then all the other departments will find it even easier, yeah. more easy. Yeah. So that was the way it went. It was very good. I think it was good for the school. This was the one thing that uh, Roger Young was very, very keen on. Yes, he, he was, drove it through. Didn't yes, he, he was yeah. very keen yeah. on that. I think that uh, allied with his uh, third form projects were the two things that yeah. he will long be remembered for. Yes, and at this very moment, there are all the th third former out yes, <laughs> doing yes. their doing their projects on hills all over Scotland. Yes. Hopefully, getting weather like we yeah, have today. like we today. Yeah. Um, then you became president of the Watsonian Club. That was after you retired, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd always been very keen on the Watsonian Club. Yes. And, uh, and when I stopped playing, I. Rugby. I followed it around a bit and became president of the rugby club at, for a couple of years. Yes. Um, and then I was asked if I'd like to become president. Now it's a big honour, as you know, well known, yes, Rod. Yes. And uh, I was absolutely thrilled. I, I, my feet were kept on the ground by Pat, who had already been president. Yes, of, of course, the, yes. Yeah, <laughs> just a, a few years ahead of yes. me. Yes. Uh, I think we'd been the first husband and wife team to become president. But she said, no, just calm down. You know, don't get too excited about it. 
it's a great thing to do mm -hmm. and you'll enjoy doing it and I'll be very happy to come with you and uh, yeah. visit all the other branch clubs. Had you, had you visited the branch clubs with her during her yes, yes, year of office? Yes, so it was yeah. a, quite a well kind face. Yeah, you were, of course. And uh, we went over to Canada too, to the Toronto Club. Yes. Uh, that was more of a fundraising uh, exercise. Yes. But uh, no, we travelled, we didn't travel other, uh, overseas apart from that trip. Mm -hmm. But uh, we went all around England and Scotland. And it, was a, it was nice seeing all these people. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, lots of people who would, at that time, well, been quite a lot older than you and you wouldn't have known at school yeah. and so on, but yeah. you still make that connection. Yes. Well, yes, because I, I mean, it's a great one for reading what's in the magazines, yes. you know, and I, I knew so many of them yeah. by repute. And, uh, and it was really quite nice to go up to somebody and say, look at them and say, you're so-and-so. Yes. And you were in the 15 in such and such a year, or, yes. or you were head of such and such an enterprise. Yeah. And then that was quite a, a nice way of you know, entering a conversation. Yes, yeah. I know of you, and yeah. therefore you know, I'm taking an interest in you. Yeah. Were you sad when that year ended? Yes, I was. Yes, yes. I think that probably, I think nowadays they're talking about doing a two year stint. Yes, that seems to be... Well, if that is the case, I think that would be a very good idea. Yeah, I think I, I would quite like to have done it too. Yes. I, I agree with you, having, yes. having done it. I felt just at the end of one year you were getting yes. to know it. Yes. Yeah. You, much, you were, you're much more relaxed off there. the edge. Yes, yes. 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 It was a very, very happy time. I enjoyed that immensely. Yeah. And you've, you've mentioned Pat having preceded you as president of the Watsonian Club and all the work and her support mm -hmm. when you were in the boarding house. Mm -hmm. She's been a real part of Watson's life too, Oh, absolutely, she? yes, yeah. ab absolutely. And, you know, having been in George Square herself, mm -hmm. and uh, she's very much a Watsonian. And yeah. I don't think either of us really look around and say it's not the best <laughs> best <laughs> school in the world, but we, we do say there's, if there's a better school than Watson's, mm -hmm. it's got to be a pretty good school. Yeah. Because I think it fulfills so many aspects of what a parent is looking for. Yes. They have a really sound education. They give it lots of extracurricular activities. I mean, apart from the playing fields, all the other things that the youngsters can do. Yes. I mean, you just need to see some of the musical performances yes. here at the school. It's phenomenal. And you kept very involved with the school, even after your time as president of the club, but you, you come to all the functions. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think I've only missed one Founders Day since 1952. Oh. And uh, we've been to most prize givings. Yes, yeah. yes. And so w we must conclude soon. We could talk, talk for ages, yeah, but we must yes. conclude. Um, you've had a, obviously a, a very long and satisfying and fulfilled life. What advice would you give, say, to a young teacher starting off now? Someone starting yeah, off at Watson's, yeah, for example. Yeah. I think it would be important for the teacher to know how important he is in the eyes of the children. I think what a, what a schoolmaster says to a child can have very far-reaching effects. I, I think it's very wrong for a teacher to say to a child, you'll never be any good at that. Oh, yeah. It's the most terrible thing to say. And I think therefore a teacher has got to think very carefully what he does say. And he must always, I think, lean slightly to the side of being much more optimistic yes. and lifting the child and giving him encouragement. So I think a schoolmaster must watch his words, be careful what he says, and give a great, huge amount of encouragement. Sometimes it's difficult, sometimes there's a sort of antagonism in, in a way between the, the person, the teacher and the pupil, but that's got to be overcome. So you, you make sure that you do the best you can for that child and give him as much support as possible. Uh, I think that would be the one thing that I would say and, and say to them that you can, if you put your mind to it, can surpass even your wildest dreams. You can do things that you may think at this moment in time only a pipe dream. I think it's just possible that you might surprise yourself at the end of the day. I realise that uh, during the main interview we didn't speak about the campus and this was something that you wanted to mention. 
How has that developed over the years? Well, when I was offered the job at Watson's and I, I, I turned up um, and walked in from Collington Road, I was absolutely aghast, pleasantly, at this wonderful facade of the building. And this was just a year, a couple of years before the cherry trees were planted along the front. And there were no cars along the front of the building because that was grass. Yes. And uh, I think at that time probably only about four <coughs> members of staff had a motor car. <laughs> so from that point of view, the front of the building looked quite di different. There were no car parking facilities on the left as you come in the top gate either. And then you could sit in the grandstand, as I used to do on many an evening in the summer, and look right down the Tipperlin. And the first thing you would see would be a line of trees, then further on a second line of trees, and finally the Tipperlin gate. There was no music school, there was nothing there whatsoever. And Just this uninterrupted sleep. Uninterrupted, and it was lovely. <laughs> and I used to finish sometimes late at night over at my side and I'd be walking back to my digs and I'd sit in the grandstand for half an hour and just look up there and feel that I really am quite blessed to be here to, to have him, yes. and to teach in this, in this, yes. in this place because it, it really was a, a lovely a lovely atmosphere. When I say it, I used to do, work quite long hours, when I came to teach it was mid-session mid in, yes. in March, so I didn't have a great deal of work during the day. Mm -hmm. That already had been allocated, so oh, I was yes. given just periods here, there, and yes. sometimes swimming, sometimes gym, mm -hmm. and certainly out in the playing fields in the afternoon. Yes. What was happening that we worked uh, four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, till five o'clock. Yes. And then on a Monday, I had my first, fifth, first 11 cricket practice, and that went on till half past eight. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, the athletic club met in the evenings. And that went on until about that same time. And on Wednesday, we had a mid-week cricket match. Mm -hmm. And that finished at about half past seven. And on these days when we had athletics, we had often inter-school competitions and we'd have tea and buns in the pavilion afterwards. Yes. So sometimes it was nine o'clock before we finished and got away home. So starting the, starting the day at nine in the morning and finishing at nine in the evening, I thought this is wonderful, yeah. great, what a wonderful way. And it was a lovely su summer that year too. It really was lovely. So I enjoyed that. It was a long day but yes. enjoyed every minute of it. When you're talking about having buns in the pavilion afterwards and so on, the, the, we have the bun room in school. Yes. Everyone calls it that. Yes. Sometimes people ask, why is it called the bun room? It is all, well, I don't know, but it was a bun room <laughs> when I arrived. Oh, right. So <laughs> yeah. And you see, well, I just, it, it would get that name. I'm just wondering whether, from Archibald Place, mm -hmm. whether there was a place there called oh, the bun yeah, room. Yes, yes. And they just brought it up yes, here. Yes. But I can remember it with, because one or two members of staff would go to the bun room rather yes. than go to the common room. Yes. And they would go to there because they could get these small greasy pies. Oh. <laughs> and and the, you had to be so careful, Rod, because yes. if you were care, careless and bit into them, oh. full of grease, and they would come all down your front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happy yeah. days. Yes. Yes. And the Craig Lockhart, um, fields, the pitches there yeah. and the pavilion, yeah. they they were in the school's possession when you arrived, were they? No, 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 no. 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 So the, the, the Craig Lockett playing fields became ours at the uh, amalgamation of the two schools. <clears throat> As part of the deal, um, oh, the university oh, got God. the girls' school yes. in George Square. Yes. Yes. And we got Craig Lock. There would be a monetary exchange as well, but I don't know the details of that. But we were given the Craig Lock at Plainfields. Yes. And this again was full of uh, history as well because mm -hmm. the, the, the university had done their athletics there yes. for years and years and years. In fact, it was only one of two places in Scotland where you could run a straight 220 yard sprint. Oh, the 220, yes, I remember. Yes, and it was yes. just a long yes. straight. Yes. So, uh, but that was over there. And I know that I was sitting on a committee when the amalgamation took place, and I met one or two of the university people, and they said, please, please do what you can to make sure that the pavilion at Craig Lockhart doesn't 
you know, de degenerate and fall yeah. apart. And he said also the clock up there is very important to us as well. Yeah. So it is great pleasure to me to know that this has all been done yeah. thanks to a very good legacy from a friend of mine. Yeah. And I think it's tremendous that John Martin's money has gone towards this because it's going to be there forever, I hope. Yes. Yes, you must have been very proud to see the, the changes and yes, the, yes. the recent opening of yes. it. And, yeah. Yes, a very good, very good indeed. Yeah. Can you talk about John Martin a little? Yes, he was a kind of special figure, John. He wasn't very tall. He um, loved his cricket. Mm. He was a slow bowler. Mm. Um, I think he mesmerized people by coming up and tossing the ball up in the air and they all thought it had really more spin or yes. a different flight than what yes. it did have. Yeah. And they would sometimes underestimate him and he used to get wickets and he he's always was a good change bowler. Bring yeah. John on and he'll something will happen. Yeah. But he was a good batsman. Yes. And he had inherited that from his father. His father was one of the best cricketers who played for yeah. Watsonians yeah. for many years. And uh, John came to Watson's to begin with and then went to Loretta. And I give credit to Loretta because I, we, he, they taught him how to play with a straight bat. Yes. And uh, he was a good cricketer. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, was, he was fun to be with. Mm -hmm. He had a oh, po yes. pocky sense of humor. Oh, right. Yes, yes, yes. But you had to get to know him really well. Yes, yes. To some people he would be just a diffident. And, but if he, if he liked you and you got on mm -hmm. well with him, you, it was good listening to him. Yes. Yeah. And so he left a, a very good legacy to the school. A good school. legacy to yeah. the school, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's going to be used not only for Craig Lockhart, but I think there's a director of cricket, mm -hmm. and I think some of his, his salary is coming from John's money as well. Yeah. So he's leaving quite a legacy to the school, which is yeah. great. Yeah. And talking of, of changes, physical changes in the department, of course the new oh. sports centre, mm -hmm. what, what do you think of that? Well, when I saw it first, I thought, gosh, really, I'm just slightly too old to apply for a job back <laughs> oh, here again. You wanted to come back? Oh, I did, <laughs> yes. yes. I thought, what a wonderful place to teach. Mm -hmm. I think the architect d deserves full marks. Mm -hmm. Using the, just the, the previous footprint, he seems to have crammed so much more into it. Mm -hmm. And it really looks a million dollars. Yeah. If that doesn't help people send their kids to Watson's, I don't know what will do. Yes. And of course there's a sadness associated with it because of Ian Brown oh, and all the work he put into it and he didn't really see the fruit of it. I, yeah. I know, it's one of these tragedies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ian will be remembered for a long, long time. Yes. He was one of these... Again, I appointed Ian and there was no, yeah. there was no question that he was going to get the job. Within about two or three minutes of speaking to him, you just knew he was somebody who mm -hmm. loved loved his job, mm -hmm. uh, knew his subject inside out, was a very friendly person. Yes. Uh, yes, he just, yeah, he was a wee bit, uh, Roy Mack was another one that I appointed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, so I, <laughs> so you're the one responsible for this too. But I take a lot of pride in that as yes, well. Yes, of course. And, uh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah, Ian is a real, it's real sad and I think some people have not come to terms with it yet. You no, know, no, no. even time. yet, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, sad, but there we are. Yeah. Okay. Happy days. Happy days.